Hello. Hopefully we are on. All right. Hello. Hello, hello. Shot time again on Thursday. Hello. Oh, man. It's going to be a little way. Hey, Vibs. Okay. You know the drill. You know the drill. Hey, Chang Hot. How are you? Okay. You know the drill on Thursdays. Mic check. Audio check. Check, check. Check, check. One, two. Check, check. Hey, Alco, how are ya? Hey, Alco. Okay. Um, audio check, mic check. Audio check, mic check. You, you sure? Okay, the sound is okay. The sound is okay. Audio gotta be good. Oh, one more thing. We are now live. All right. Hopefully that makes a big difference. So now we are live. Hello, everyone. Yes, welcome to the 10th episode of uh, introduction, my introduction to security course uh, offered at Tufts University. I'm Ming Chow, uh, associate teaching professor, yada, 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 yada. Yeah. Drew Fish wants to be first, okay. Yes, 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 okay, we'll give that. Uh, by the way, I see a lot of familiar people on uh, a lot of familiar people on uh, on Twitch. I want to say, um, hey, and Dunn, hey, JRN. I want to say thank you for all your um, all your support. I say I want to say thank you so much for all your support this um, this semester. It's been a fun one, and I hope that you have enjoyed this semester as well. Hey, malware unicorn! My my, so. We have a luminary with us today, Malware Unicorn. Um, in fact, I'm going to give her an enormous shout out later on. Uh, an enormous shout out. Uh, this is what, my fifth season, my fifth year doing this, and it's customary to give a big thank you to Malware Unicorn. Um, so, I actually, uh, that Wow, okay, that took, took me by a huge surprise. I want to say, first and foremost, today's topic is really hands-on, and it is on malware and malware analysis. Um, a full disclaimer, uh, I am not an expert in malware and malware and all malware analysis. If you want to talk to a mal uh, an expert in malware or malware analysis, we got one in the room today on Twitch with us. So we are very, very honored today. Um, we are very, very honored. In fact, I've taught the security course for over 10 years. And I think at least eight of those years, I have definitely mentioned or uh, mentioned Malware Unicorn in multiple capacity, including um, PCAP analysis as well. Um, so, I want to start off by just giving the real preliminaries on, on what malware is. Some of the really, really basic definition. I'm just going to gloss over this for like a few minutes. I will come back to definitions a little bit later for a very, very good, a very, very good reason. Uh, so what is malware? Malware is a malicious software, okay? Now, as I explained, definitely I mentioned this a few times this week, there are many types of malware. Malware is a very broad term for malicious software. When I explained this, uh, I said to people, think of malware as like organized crime. The organized crime has a number of families. And these families have very, very different tricks of the trade. So the different types of malware are like virus, worm, backdoor, Trojan horse, root kit, ransomware. In fact, what, today's on today's uh, uh, today what I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a hands-on example of three of these virus backdoor and a Trojan horse 
we're gonna do those we're gonna actually show and like actually show how they actually how they work today uh, a zombie has just infected a compromised uh, computing device I think we've all been a zombie at least once or a few times in our lifetimes um, a botnet is just a network uh, a bunch of network uh, infested machines bot herder is an attacker who controls a botnet uh, and command and control is an infrastructure of uh, software uh, and servers and software to control uh, malware and a botnet. So one of the things that is, you know, I've been involved in security for well over a decade, and it's just really sad, even up to this day, of people using terms like viruses and worms interchangeably. There's still a lot of misconceptions. I want to definitely clarify that today, okay? I'm not going to mention about Windows, but uh, you can see these slides on cs116.org. Okay, so the first thing I want to mention is a virus. So, a virus works exactly like how a biological virus works. Let's please, for today, let's, you know, please do not mention that biological virus. I think we, we're living in currently a time of a certain biological virus. But we're not going to mention, let's play a little fun game here. Let's not mention that biological virus by name and instead just call it thou shall not, uh, you know, you know, um, what is that in Harry Potter? Like, you know, thou shall not mention his name, okay? Or just say that biological virus. If you have an, if you, I mean, we, you know, for the last two years, we've had, yeah, he will who now, how, he who shall not be named. Um, we're going to do that with, uh, that certain biological virus that we've been dealing with for the last two to three plus years, okay? If you actually have an understanding how that virus works, the same way how, um, uh, a computer virus generally works. Uh, this virus can be, take form of an executable or script, um, a document containing macros, but here's the catch. The caveat is this. There needs to be a way, a virus needs to be triggered somehow in some way. There gotta be a trigger event. For example, the most simple a tr trigger event is double clicking on a file or running the executable. When that happens, a couple things happen. Number one, the virus actually will propagate and spread and piggyback to other files and whatnot. There is also going to be a certain payload that is going to be executed of some sort. Um, this payload can do some can pretty can do some pretty bad stuff, such as oh, let's say um, oh, let's do uh, removing all files on your uh, uh, certain uh, removing certain files on your system, uh, installing a keylogger, uh, think you, you name it. Okay, so. There is going to be some trigger event, some spreading, and uh, some sort of a payload, okay? So, this is a virus. On the other hand, I'm sure a lot of people have also heard of worms before. Now, a worm is completely self-contained, okay? Does not need to attach itself to another file. And, but here's the important caveats, well, two of them, that besides it just works on its own, a worm works on its own, it gotta work on a, a network as well too. So it spreads on a network. So wait a minute, how does a worm actually work under the hood? Well, if you've actually, you, you know, we've done what, 10 of these episodes on Twitch this, year, this season? You, you know all the tools and all the techniques um, that would make a worm work. Things like uh, using remote commands such as SSH, RSH, password cracking, sockets. Uh, you've done all that this semester. You've done all that this uh, in the last three months. Now you actually understand why that I structured this course the way I did. Uh, because if we started this course af, you know, with malware, imagine this was the first topic. And we did a live exercise on actually uh, malware traffic inside uh, packets captures. If I did malware, you would have no understanding, no idea what would, uh, what, what would go on. You have no idea what password cracking is, or what remote commands are, or uh, network scanning, or uh, packets. Wouldn't know that. Okay? So I'm going to stop my definitions here. So now let's get to the real fun stuff. 
Let's get to the real fun stuff. Let's do some live demonstration of malware, starting off with a virus. Now this virus that I'm going to demonstrate, it's really damn harmless. It's only used for educational purposes only. This piece of virus is actually, these three pieces of malware that you're going to see, including the virus, were not written by me. They were not written by me. And some of these are actually, two of them have, were written a long time ago. One of them is still, is still live. Okay, it's still live. Okay, so let's do a demonstration of a piece of virus first. Now this virus, I will actually, I actually have the source code available on GitHub. At a, just at github.com, and I am shell zero one. A whole bunch of this crap here. Aha, here it is. This was created five years ago. I put this on my GitHub just five years ago, and this piece of virus is called a Foo virus. I want to give a shout out to Avi Cock, who uh, I don't know if he's still at Purdue. Um, Avi Cock wrote this uh, when he was a professor at Purdue uh, in 2006. All right, and so here is the comp here is the source code. Okay, now I'm actually going to blow this up on uh, Visual Studio Code. Got a copy of this running in this folder called Malware. I have three pieces of malware here. Mm. Got a malware, got a full virus. Here we go. And here's this full virus. This piece of virus was written in a programming language called Perl. I don't know how many of you folks here have written stuff in Perl before, P-E-R-L. It's built into almost all operating systems, except for Windows. Um, Perl is an old language. It used to be extremely popular, uh, used for system, largely for system administration purposes. Then it evolved to writing web apps as well, too. I have written web apps in Perl before, back in the good old days, yes. Pearl is, um, let me put it in a nice way, it smells like C, it smells like C, but um, it can also get to really, really, really weird quickly, so a lot of people has describe Pearl as like a second coming of voodoo at times, well here it is, this piece of virus is 37 lines, okay, this piece of virus is 37 lines. The comments are in the, uh, the pound symbol. There's a whole print, uh, bunch of print statements here. This whole series of print statement, the whole series of print statement uh, is actually the payload, okay? The payload that does the quote-unquote damage is just a bunch of printouts. So here we go. Um, What's important to remember, this is 37 lines. Uh, this piece of virus is 37 lines. Uh, okay, let's go to the actual meat and potatoes now. Uh, okay, so lines number 23 to 25, there is a loop that actually goes from 0 to 37. Uh, this, yeah, so what these 1, 2, 3 lines do, 23 to 25, it's just going to read its entire, um, this entire piece of virus in. All 37 lines of code here. Then what it will do, and then the next block of code, this for each statement here from lines numbers 26 to 37, what it will do, it will try to find all the files in the current working directory with the extension .foo. When it, for each and every file that ends in an extension .foo, it will open the file, pop on, um, well, all 37 lines of the virus that you see here, um, commenting out everything else, and also changing the file permissions. So this is how these all 37 lines of code actually work. Uh, this is how this virus works. So let me go demonstrate this now. And so I have a folder called malware on my desktop. I'm going to use my terminal. I'll show you malware. 
All right. So we have three pieces of malware here. Full virus, sample.apk, teeny.exe. Of these three pieces of real malware, only foolvirus.pl is the um, safe one for educational purposes. So I'm going to use a few examples here. Uh, okay, so I am going to make a new file, fiscools.foo. I'm just going to put, what, happy Thanksgiving. And that's it. So now I have a file name. I created a file name, fiscools.foo. And I'm going to create another file. Vim. I'm going to say Vim uh, Jedi Chrome. Thanks for subscribing. Okay, and I can do the chosen one. All right, what else? I'm going to do, for IIS, I'm going to create a brand new full file called iisdova.foo. Uh, let me see. Ah, uh, let me see, say, say what I can say. Okay, I'm also going to create a file called droofish. Actually, I'll stop there for now. If I do an LS. So now, this folder of malware now contains not one that contains more than three files. In fact, I created drewfish.bar, fiskools.foo, iisdova.foo, jedichrome.foo. Okay. Now, let's take a look. I'm going to clear my screen, but this time I'm going to do an LS L. Now, I want you to take a visual snapshot. I want you to take a visual snapshot of this listing of files in the malware directory. I want you to take a visual snapshot. Take a look at the file permissions uh, to find the respective file sizes. Okay, you see Fiskus is, uh, dot foo is 21 bytes. IIS Dova is 16 bytes. Uh, Jedi Chrome is 35 bytes, and Drewfish.bar 37 bytes. All right, no magic tricks. That's Drewfish.bar. Okay, that's your schools. And let's take a look at the content of Jedi Chrome. So far, so good. So far, so good. Now, it's time for me to run the virus. Run the full virus. So, there's two ways I can run the virus. One, I can set the permission of foovirus.pl to uh, be an executable. And I just do dot slash foovirus.pl. Or... I can run, you, you know, send it to the, the Perl interpreter, Perl, foovirus.pl. Watch what happens. Now watch what happens. Nothing special. Hello from Foovirus. This is a demonstration of how easy it is to write a self-replicating program. This virus will infect all the files with names ending in .foo in the directory in which you currently, which you execute an infected file. If you send an infected file to someone else and they execute it, the .foo files will be damaged as well. 
Note that this is a BIOS for educational purposes since it did not carry a harmful payload. It also does it, uh, all it does is print out this message and comment out the code in that boot file. That's it. That's it. Okay. So now I'm going to clear the screen again, but this time I'm going to do an LS minus L again to do a detailed listing of all the files in the malware directory. Take a look. Notice something? Okay, what do you now notice? A couple things should be, well, let's take a look at drewfish.bar. Drewfish.bar, no, no, nothing changed. We got drewfish.bar is, well, drewfish does not end in that boo. But, ooh, let's take a look at jedichrome.foo. Now, you may notice that the .foo file, the size has ballooned to over a thousand Ks. Not good. More JediChrome.foo. Notice. This is JediChrome.foo. Now you notice that JediChrome.foo, the file now contains the actual virus that the malware itself can see the line in it, you know, the content all got commented out. You also notice for each of the .foo files, each of the permission of chain for each of the .foo file, read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read, write, execute across the board. Take a look at Fiscus, same idea. Everything got commented out. Okay, so now, We've seen some changes here on the system. We've seen some changes after running that foo virus. I'm not done yet. This time, actually, this time, I'm actually going to create a few more dot foo files. Thanks for all your support. This uh, yeah. I'm gonna do another one and done. Is it is end doom? Oh, I wonder what your real name is. You don't need to. I still haven't figured it out. Okay, so I have created two brand new .foo files. I have created two, because I don't have, I don't remember I have a student with the name D-U-N-E. I don't remember. I don't, I, I'm pretty, I have a pretty good memory. I don't remember anyone with a D-U-N-E as a uh, last name, as a student in, in the actual class. All right, so now we have uh, our two brand new foo file, and Dune and Shanghai. But this time, knowing that I, I asked, well, just double check, never heard to double check, uh, I, I asked Dover.foo, also got the, you know, also got the virus. Now this time, I'm actually going to run an infected file. Um, I'm not going to run Pearl, uh, foovirus.pl again. This time, I'm just going to run iisdover.foo. Because IIS Dover.foo, what we just saw moments ago, has a copy of the virus. And also we know IIS Dover.foo is now an executable file. Let's open up IIS Dover.foo. Take a look. Okay. Now, I'm going to clear the screen. So we got the same payload, which is good. But this time, what do we notice? We know Shanghot.foo now file size ballooned and also file permission change and endune.foo also same thing file size ballooned um file permissions have also changed okay so now if we take a look at changhot okay let's take a look at drewfish.bar still safe nothing but let's take a look at IIS Dover.foo. Thanks for stopping by.
Thanks for stopping by, my old unicorn. Your big shout out's coming later because I'm going to reference your reverse engineering 101 resource. Is do. <laughs> oh, 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 is that is Dova. Oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. So I, 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 I asked, well, IIS, when I always think of IIS over, is I always think of, um, uh, Microsoft IIS. I've been brainwashed by, you know, for a while. But notice for IIS Dover.foo, why I'm showing you this file again, is she already, like, uh, he, she, it already got, it's already got infected, so it doesn't get reinfected again. So you wouldn't see, multiple copies of the uh, of the malware uh, you wouldn't see multiple copies of the malware same thing with um, Jedi Chrome Jedi Chrome will only have one copy of the malware okay so now we have all the dot foo files um, affected yeah and if I do this again, um, you know, ldsauce.foo, do that, ldsauce, five bytes. So this time I'm just going to run shanghot.foo. There it is. LD sauce now also has balloon. Now LD sauce that food got infected. Yep. Mm-hmm. So that's an this is an example of a piece of uh, piece of virus. Do the pre-infected this is a good question. Do the pre-infected file get reinfected? Yes, yeah, that's an important point. The pre-infected food file do not get reinfected once I rerun it. No, no. No, the pre-infected file do not get reinfected, and that actually it ties in really well. So if again I go do a more Jedi Chrome dot foo, Jedi foo only got one copy of the of the virus, not multiple. I think I run this thing three times already. Like I ran over a piece of malware three times, well three different three different variations of it. Um, no, only one. However, you actually this is actually meant to just actually make sense and it ties in. Um, with how biological viruses work. So just for the sake of argument that you already, let's say, let's say for the sake of argument that you currently, uh, got, hopefully that this, this is, you don't have it at this moment, that imagine that you got it, that, that you currently have that virus in your system, or you have the cold, or you have the flu. And if someone decided to cough on you with one of those, uh, with, let's say you already have, let's say you already have the, uh, have the cold, okay? You currently have the cold. Someone else actually has the cold. Then you talk to the person who has the cold. You don't get reinfected with the cold again while you're having the cold. Yeah. Okay. So, how do you defend against viruses? Well, okay. So, okay. I had to bring this up. So, I actually set myself into a trap. This actually brings up the conversation about how antivirus actually works. Anyone here actually want to take a wild guess on how antivirus worked for the longest time? For the longest time, does anyone actually know how viruses works? Oh, shit. Okay, so now I got a slew of comments now. The one that really took me by, so that really took is a great question from Chang Han. Are there any viruses that could be, that could infect the computer even if we run it on a virtual machine? The short answer is off the top of my head. I don't actually know off the top of my head, but can that happen? The answer is, Although virtual machines are generally used to isolate, you know, to gen virtual uh, virtual machines are generally used to isolate, you know, from your actual host, your working computer. There is, there are instances that a virus 
can infect your main computer, your host, even though you run it on a virtual machine. But you got to be real stupid. And that is a case I have actually seen. If you actually, like, share files between your host and your virtual machine, like, if you people do that. People actually, you know, share files. Um, like, they have, like, a file share or, like, a folder where the virtual machine can use, the host can use, and when you actually open that up, yeah, that actually, right there, you know, you could actually have a case where, oh, anything that you run on the virtual machine can actually infect anything that's not actually running on your host, because you decided to, you just had to be dumb enough to actually open a file sharing, okay? So, actually, how does the antivirus work is, okay, and this is the problem, uh, Chase, oh, I'm sorry, C Pinky 12 you said, known previous viruses and detect them, LD sauce also correct, database, Chang Hot said scanning, Yellen Fen, uh, Yellen Fen said hash signature, RZ2752050, um, if file matches, huge database, a possible thing, block it, that's it. That's basically how antivirus works. Okay, so one dumb way to actually, you can actually create an antivirus engine right now, um, take all this code here, now, you can do like, let's create, let's, let's get, do the shot, let's see if we get that, let's do, let's do something dumb, like MD5, some of foovirus.pl, and here you go, alright, if we see any code that actually has, uh, if we see any, if we actually, here it is, bang, we have a signature, F27, yada, MD5 checksum, 221, all right, if we find this file, if we find a file with an MD5 sum on a system, all right, we block it. This is exactly what RZ2750 was just mentioning. And this is how traditional antivirus uh, works. What's the problem with this whole system? Can anyone tell me what's the problem with it? Like this. Does this work anymore? Well, that's it. As I, uh, I uh, as Dover said, change a single byte and the hat changes. That happened. And now, we're in an age where viruses, if not all malware, they change form all the time. Okay? You can have the biggest damn dictionary in the world. Okay? You can have the biggest damn dictionary of malware in the world. And, yeah, good luck trying to stop anything because, you know, what, you know, you got to understand how malware, that they change form all the time. Put it this way, I'll just say, and I'll say it on the air, and I've said this a number of times, is that antivirus and anti-malware software is bullshit, okay? I haven't been running, I have not run anti-malware, antivirus for over 15 years. What's even worse what I'm even more ironic is, what if I told you some of the most insecure software out there, well, is anti-malware software. If you actually, is anyone answered by Norton antivirus, the newest new version of Norton? Well, that's it. Um, hold on. I gotta find this, you, because you won't believe this shit. Norton antivirus. Um, Norton, Norton antivirus now um, mines cryptocurrency. Can't make this up. There you go. No one, there you go. This is very recent. This was as of early this year. No one, 360 antivirus now mines cryptocurrency link. Really? Forget the fact. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's like, yeah. I mean, this is. Eh? So, so forget the fact that. Antivirus, anti-malware actually can slow down your machine. It actually does even worse shit now. Really? Here you go. I'm not bo I'm not making this up. Hello? Like, really? Why antivirus does work it. I'll tell you this. Antivirus still actually works to one degree. To block malware that was block for that was created in like the two thousands. Okay, so speaking of that, speaking of that, you know what, you know what, before I actually get into my favorite demonstration of a back door, I know that she has left, but 
One of the things I really want to let you all know right now, I said earlier for a reason that I'm not an expert on malware analysis. The one that you want to go, I want to introduce you to Malware Unicorn. Um, actually, I, if you actually, she's a real person. I'm, um, I keep very well known in the cybersecurity community. That's a Twitter handle. Um, this is a great article about her. Oh, man. She's Malware Unicorn on Twitter. Oh, God. So, yeah, I mean, her real name is, you know, this is pretty obvious. It's um, Amanda Rousseau. And um, this is a great article. There's many, this has been many good articles about her. Um, there she is. You can do that. What if you design an antivirus to query every file with something like anti? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all right. So we're gonna get to that next. Actually, hold that thought for a second. So there's so many articles on um, malware unicorn um, Amanda Rousseau, but her website uh, malwareunicorn.org uh, she gives free training. She has a, a number of workshops. In fact. Um, Pre-pandemic, she used to do presentations for us at the Wall of Sheep in the Packet Hacking Village at DEF CON like every year. Uh, if you go to malwareunicorn.org, the workshops that she have are PE injection study, um, anti-analysis techniques. But the one that is of serious interest that I would strongly recommend anyone to review or like, to, to go to is, again, these are all free, Reverse Engineering 101. I'll send a link. There it is. So this uh, workshop actually um, provides the fundamentals on reverse engineering with Windows malware. It's all hands-on. Uh, uh, reverse engineering is RE. Uh, you'll also be learned, uh, introduced to reverse engineering terms, software tools, um, uh, Intel x86 assembly programming, uh, reviewing uh, you know, and malware techniques. Uh, this of course will conclude by participating in performing hands-on malware analysis that consists of triage, static, and dynamic analysis. Didn't we do that last week? Static and dynamic analysis? Here's what you'll learn. Uh, this is what you need. Um, the process of reverse engineering is taking a piece of software, a piece of code that usually is pretty like, pre-compiled, and then understanding how it works, okay? So, yeah, I mean, people do this with, like, they take apart, like, Windows, or they take apart, like, the Grand Theft Auto binary to take a look and see how it works, okay? But, of course, reverse engineering is really used in uh, malware to understand how malware and malware analysis work. Analysis based on analysis flow for malware analysis. Set up a baseline, to, uh, ba uh, baseline environment. Triage is from a starting point. Static analysis, get a sense of where everything is before debugging, no code execution. Dynamic analysis, determine behavior that can't be understood by static analysis, manual debugging. Uh, the environment set up um, uh, to use a virtual machine. Victim uh, VM, sniffer VM. Here's a caveat for you. These can only now work, uh, these VMs can only work on Intel uh, machine, not the new Mac M1s. She gets into a description of how a Windows portable executable format work, PE, the x86 uh, assembly language. Uh, ooh, this. Typical attack flow. Reconnaissance exploitation, and this looks familiar, doesn't it? When we, we, we basically did a very, very similar, di we saw a similar diagram when we did reconnaissance, when we did Edmap. Transmit, command and control, exfiltration and purge. But take a look at the malware classes. A virus, code that propagates, replicates across system with user intervention. That's what we just did. A worm is code that self-propagates, replicates across system without requiring user intervention. Exactly what I said earlier. Now you actually will not know why I'm actually regurgitating my definition just to prove that I'm not a fool. A, 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 a Trojan is malware often disguised as legitimate software. Ransomware is that um, holds a victim 
data hostage by cryptography or other means. This one. Here's a whole bunch of malware classes. But my all-time favorite malware class is this. A backdoor. Enables a remote attacker to have access to or send commands to a compromised computer. Backdoors are my absolute favorite. A backdoor bypasses every security mechanism that is built onto your computer. Bypasses authentication, passwords, you name it. Backdoor just opens up your computer there for the taking. The only thing that you need is an IP address if you're an attacker. Um, if you have been following the news, does anyone remember um, how many people have been following the idea of crypto uh, like backdoors for like things like the iPhone? for law enforcement. Have anyone been following that story for years? Is each and every year there's always a story about how the government or law enforcement want a backdoor onto um, any technological device, hardware, software. And now what you're going to see and why that whole idea is complete garbage. Okay? So now it is my chance, my fun to actually demonstrate to you a backdoor. A real back door. My favorite piece of back door is called Teeny. T I N I. Okay? It used to be available. Yeah. Hi, I am Hadriel. Hadriel. Yeah. Now I'm going to show you why the idea of a back door. Back door, I can bypass every security mechanism like on a device. My favorite piece of backdoor, it's still available, like on the web, although you have to go to archive.the Wayback Machine to use it. It's called Teeny, T-I-N-I. -I. I'll send you the link, so it's going to take some time. So here is Teeny. Teeny T-I-N-I. This is on the Wayback Machine. NTSecurity.nu is no longer, uh, like, this page is no longer available. But this was up for years. For years. Okay. But how would you know, oh, okay, that's a great question, but how would you Back to an iPhone. It's my understanding that the data is softly encrypted every time it lost. Um, yeah, the only thing I can think of is like a little piece of software like, like this, LD Sauce. I'm going to demonstrate this little piece of backdoor. Teeny, T-I-N-I, is a simple and very small 3 kilobyte backdoor for Windows. Coded in assembler. It listens at TCP port 7777 and gives anybody who connects a, uh, who connects a remote command prompt. So also, you know that this whole season I've been mentioning and using this port 7777. Now you actually understand why that I've been using this port number. It alludes to today. It's been alluding, a pre like it's been a premonition for today. Because Teeny is a piece of malware that uses, well, port 7777. Okay? Now, Doom is 6666. How you use the Teeny is the following. Download the .exe file and run it. Connect it with an ordinary telnet client or similar to a CCV port, port 777, and press Enter 1. Now you see the command prompt and able to retype commands. Okay. So, can you still download this? The answer is yes. Watch what happens when I try to download it. I'm going to save it to my desktop. I'm going to hit save. But notice that uh, if you go to Down Tools Downloads on your web browser, in this case Firefox, look at this. This file contains a virus or malware, archive.org. So you have a choice, okay, to allow to download or delete it. I'm going to delete it because I already have a copy of it in, in my download folder. If you're going to download a teeny.exe on Windows, you're sure as hell going to actually get a uh, Windows uh, Defender going to actually, like, set off some alarms. Okay? So, I'm going to open up... Now, for those of you who don't know, just a real quick review. Generally speaking, 
If you actually download something suspicious, it's a pretty good idea to actually use send it to virus total. Virus total. I'm going to use virus total for a few times a day. Virus total I can. Could this be detected by way of a port scan? The answer is, I think, yeah, I think so. Is Dover? I think so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. The port needs to be open to connect this, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm like 99.9999, if not 100% sure, that it can be detected by way of a port scan. Absolutely. Virus total. Analyze the suspicious file, domain, IPs, and URL to connect that detect malware and other breaches and automatically share them with the security community. Virus total is your friend when it, uh, in uh, uh, malware analysis. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to upload the copy of Teeny that's in here in malware.txt. I'm going to choose info. Oh dear. Hold on. It's Dover. You gotta actually hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. This is actually you, you're getting somewhere real fun. I'm gonna choose a file malware. Teeny.exe. Look at that. Wah! 61 out of 72. Look at that. Hello, hello. 61 out of 72 uh, security vendors flagged this as malicious. Look at that. Wah! Look at that. Okay, I, I asked Dover, uh, you got to hold your thought. Look at that. Oh, oh my God! Oh, 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 here we go. So you may be wondering which, which, what, 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 what the anti, what the security vendors who didn't uh, detect this were: Baidu, F Secure, Palo Alto Net. Really? Zone Alarm? Really? You serious? Ah, uh, Semantic Mobile Insight unable to process. Unbelievable. For only three kilobyte, yes. Further proof this is not bullsh- Yeah, here it is. Three kilobyte. Three side. Get better. Details. Here your uh, MD5, the basic property, SHA-1, SHA-256. Here you go. It's a Windows 32 executable. Three kilobytes. There you go. History. First analyzed. Created in September of 2000. Yay. First seen in a while. That's a weird time. Created in 2000, but first seen in the wild, used in October 2009. Really? Okay. Teeny had been actually been up. This file been uploaded a number of times under a whole bunch of different names. Teeny.exe. Look at that. Mycock.exe. Import. Kernel 32. Windstock 32. Relationships. Look at that. Hey, okay, that's weird. Shouldn't have any IP address. Behaviors and community. What? Okay. So, <clears throat> all right. So it's crystal clear. This looks like malware, but I don't think you fully understand how this damn thing actually works. Well, you see, I don't have Windows anymore on my home network at all. So, that's the bad news, but the great news is I have a video of exactly what I did back in the heydays. Yeah, before I got rid of my home lab, I actually created videos. One of the videos is this. All right, I'm going to start. I'm going to up, 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 up. I'm going to stop here. Now, here is an example of teeny.exe in action. So here it is. This was here's my desktop. And I'm going to open up a Windows Virtual Machine, a, a Windows Virtual Machine, Windows 7. Look at that. I'm going to start up Windows. 
I'm going to enter my password. Now I'm going to pause it here. Now remember, there are two machines going. My attacking machine is my Mac. My victim is the Windows. One cat, I believe this video that I renamed um, teeny.exe as fortnite.exe. Yeah, I am on Windows. I'm going to open up uh, Windows Explorer. God rest his soul. I'm going to go to a website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, November 6th of 2019. Cool. No, no, that, that got to be old. Now I'm going to go to a uh, some some website to go download uh, teeny.exe. This doesn't exist anymore, so here it is. I'm going to download fortnite.zip, which is really going to... fortnite.zip. I'm going to save this. Fortnite.zip. When I unzip it, it's going to have a copy of teeny.exe. Save it to my desktop. One kilobyte. Close. Close the damn browser. There you go. What am I doing? So I'm going to close that. Now I'm going to actually unzip Fortnite. Uh, unzip Fortnite. Extract all. Now I'm going to pause here. You can see that Fortnite.exe is three kilobyte, which is really teeny.exe. I'm going to save it to my desk. Save it to the desktop. No. Oh, I already, I already did. So I'm going to run open up cmd.exe for a second. The reason why I want to run cmd.exe is I want to get the IP address of this virtual machine, this Windows virtual machine that's running on my home network. By way of IP config. So remember this IP address, 192.168.1.205. 192.168.1.205 is the IP address of the Windows uh, virtual machine. Okay. Now, I'm going to run Fortnite.exe. I'm going to run it. In other words, I'm running teeny.exe. Now, uh, who was it that actually... Um, now, I'm going to pause it here. Definitely, who was it? Was it, I, was it you, I, uh, is Dover, that actually said... Uh, who was it that said that you, if you do a port scan... Shit, I wish I did this. If you do a port scan on this Windows machine... That you will see port 7777 open. And yeah, and the answer is, yeah, pretty sure. I'm 100% sure you will now, you do an Nmap scan on the IP address on the Windows machine. 192.168.1.205. Yeah. Can I do a netcat? Well, nothing. What the hell? Why doesn't it work? NC. Oh, I had to hit the enter key again. I'll go step, take a step back. So, all you do is netcat 192.168.1.205, the IP address of the Windows box, port 7777. But you hit return twice. Hit return again. Four, yep. Boom. Look at that. Now, a backdoor, you can do whatever I want. Fire up calc.exe. Calculator got fired up. I gotta go to my desktop, I even create files. I create a tummy.txt file. There you go. Of course, that's it. Of course, the next step is I can do all the dirty sinful business by just getting, you know, I can also do RM minus RF if I want. But you notice, running a back door. Running a back door just opens up your machine. Just opens up the machine. You notice that I didn't even need to do any like security. There's no security mechanism necessary. No login. No nothing necessary. Just on the attacking machine. Just fire up Netcat IP address port seven 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 seven. 
hit enter twice do whatever whatever dirty sinful business I want this is why back doors are so fucking dangerous these are why bad uh, back doors are so dangerous because well I'm further access to anything so yeah, they, they say, oh yeah, we're going to build a crypto, we're going to do a backdoor onto an iPhone or any on any piece of technology, but only law enforcement can have it. But as you know, like if law enforcement can have it, what, what why can't all, why can't anyone else can find out? You know, it's a backdoor of Windows the same as a remote control function, it kind of is in this case, yeah. Is the backdoor of Windows the same as a remote control function? Sure is, in this case. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, I do want to... Hold up. I want to get into something else for a second. I want to go to Is Dover. You mentioned above, it said, could it be configured on a common port like to to if uh, you have SSH set up, the answer is no and yes. I wish I did this before. Um, there is a way. Hold up for a second. I want to close this up. I want to see what happens if I try to open up teeny.exe on uh, TextEdit. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to open it anyway. Oh. Mm -hmm. Is there a hex editor for window after uh, Visual Studio Code? Actually, let me see if there's a hex editor. Ooh, there is. There's a hex editor. A hexadecimal editor is allows uh, for viewing and editing files in a hex editor. I'm going to install. Ooh, this is exactly what I need. Open files as hex. Find and replace. Okay. So, why, what's the whole purpose of a hexadecimal editor? A hexadecimal editor is for manipulating files in their raw hexadecimal representation. I mean, that could be anything, including binaries. Did I install this? Yeah, I did. I just did. So what I'm going to do now in visuals, now that I've installed a hex editor, I want to open up teeny.exe and hex. Watch this. I hope this works. I I didn't even prepare for this. teeny.exe. Open it anyway? Yeah! Holy crap, it works! I don't want to open it as a text editor, but now I actually had that text editor, that, uh, hex editor actually installed. Look at that. Yeah, this is awesome. Okay, so now we have the decoded text. But um, what I want to find is... Wait, okay, so I want to answer... Um, I, I asked Dover, your question, now how many, let's go back, okay, good, I said 61 out of 72, I'm going to leave this here, but, while I, it's not a good idea to change it from port, actually I could, I could change, I could configure teeny.exe to be in port 6, uh, to be in port from 7777 to 22, no, I don't I want to skip this version, damn it. I could do that. I could still do that. So, is Dover... I could do something very much like what you're proposing. But to connect, yeah, I mean, I can very much do that. So what I'm going to do now is, how do I do that? Well, now I have a hex editor. What I can do is I can find a representation of 7777 and change it to, like, some other number. So can someone here do some math? 
Uh, what is 7777 from decimal to hex? Does anyone remember? Does anyone know? Oh my god. Dex to hex. No, I'm going to use... Alright, here we go. I'm going to use a decimal value 7777. Convert... Okay, 1E61. 7777 to hex from decimal... 7777 to hex is 1E61. Can I find 1E61 here? What? Is there 1E61? I need 1E61. Hey, how does this thing, does this thing work? Can I do a fine here? Is there one E61 anywhere? Come on, there gotta be a one E61 somewhere here. If it is possible, it is one E61. I know it is here somewhere. Oh man. Okay, wait. How does a find actually work? Can I actually find something here? I need to find... No. You just have to find 1E61 here. I know it's here somewhere. Can anyone find it? Hold on, is there an edit? Find and files. Damn. No. There gotta be a 1E61 somewhere here. Oh man. Oh. Nope. So what you want to do is you want to find 1E61 somewhere here. I'm surprised I can't find I'm surprised you can't find this one. There's three one. I need six one. One E61. Yeah, but I can't even find a one. I mean, really? Oh, here it is. Okay, here we go. Yeah, we're just putting a whole bunch of ones, though. This is so weird because I know, well, I've done this before. There got to be a 1E61 here. So what you want to do is change E6. No. It's definitely here, but it's not letting me find by way. I mean, this is, well, this is again, brand new for all of us. Um, I've never used this hex editor before. So, to IIS2 is Dover, find the instance of 1E61 here, which is a representation of 7777, change it to the hex equivalent of, let's say, 22. Yeah, it's only going to find the decoded section, which is, like, not what we're looking for. Damn it, I need a 1E61 here. I know I've seen this before. Huh. 
Yeah, time to use another. Oh. No, 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 no. Um, yeah, find one E61 here in teeny.exe. Then all you need to do is just change it. Change it to um, uh, the hex equivalent of whatever port number you're looking for. I think so. Yeah. With Netcat to port 20, yep, absolutely. Because I've done this before. So would Netcat to port 22 open up a command line? And no, only command line. Only command line. Only command line. Uh, here, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to change one byte of this thing. I'm just going to be so stupid. Yep, there's 6 1 here, but I need 1 E61. What happened if I did this? E E. And now I'm going to do a file save as. Uh, Among Us. .exe. I'm going to save that. Alright, whatever. Okay. So now, let's see what happens if I try to upload Among Us. <laughs> .exe with like a 2 byte change. Yeah, come. All right, see what happens. Are we gonna fool? I uh, all right, we got some. We didn't fool a couple. So if we were successful in changing the port number, yeah, you would just netcat into port twenty-two, but it will open up a command line, no SSH. Holy shit! So isn't that crazy? So all we did was we changed two by like two bytes. Uh, of teeny.exe and we completely threw everything off. Look at that. 7 out of 61. Can you believe that? Really? Okay. Yeah, sorry that I couldn't change uh, if I, yeah, if so the servers would overwrite whatever was on the port to begin with. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. So the servers would overwrite uh, the port, so instead of port I used to do this from port 7777 to, let's say, port, like, 6767. That's what I did back then. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the service would over... You can try it. You can try it on your own. It's a fun exercise. It's a fun exercise. Okay. We'll do one more real uh, malware analysis uh, exercise. We're going to still need virus total. But this time, uh, we're going to look at what the hell is this sample.apk. Well, sample, well, if you see an APK file, we'll go back to virus total. Choose a file, sample.apk. You ready? I'm going to send sample.apk to virus total, and ooh, here we go. Sample.apk, 27 out of 62 security vendors flagged this as a malicious file. Yeah, I see a lot of Trojan, fake app, Trojan, Android. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So what is this thing? Go to details. Yeah, your basic properties. MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, yada, yada, yada. First file submission was in October, in August of 2020. Goes by a whole bunch of different names. Android. Android APK. Ooh, this is not good. Look at all the permissions that this Android, this Android app has. Send SMS, read phone state, read contacts. That's weird as hell. Receive, okay. Yeah, just download the APK file and just send the virus total. Look at that. Even see all the activities, the services, the URLs. Interesting strings, eh? Geo.com. Play.google.somewhere in CloudFront. What the hell? 3.073 megabytes. Now, okay, so we know that this is malware. But now let's actually do a reverse engineering and take this app apart. 
So the tool that we're going to use is something called APK tool. APK tool. APK tool is a tool to reverse uh, engineer APK uh, Android APK files. Free and open source. Uh, caveat: You need Java. You need Java in, ever, in order to run APK tool. Okay. APK tool is really, really easy to use. Uh, a tool for, for reverse engineering third-party closed binary Android apps. It can decode resources to nearly original form and rebuild them from make every and then and rebuild them after making modifications. You need Java. So if you're Mac OS, here we are. So if you have Homebrew, you can just do brew install APK tool. But just by just that by itself doesn't work. Yeah. But you also need to do I think I have um is it open JDK? I use open JDK on my stuff. Yeah, I use open. But the first thing that you really got to do is brew install open JDK, the Java development kit. Okay. So now, once you actually have installed both open JDK or Java for whatever your um, uh, system is, and you have installed uh, APK tool, yes, one APK tool. Let's take a look. Here it is, APK tool. It's a uh, tool for reverse engineering APK files with Smiley and back Smiley. Okay. So all you need to do to reverse engineer an APK file is APK tool D, the D code, and then just the name of your APK. So I have uh, one APK here, which we just use, sample.apk. APK tool D, sample.apk. There it is. Load, uh, loading resource table, decoding Android manifest. Okay. All right. Well, here we go. So everything got saved into the folder called sample, CD sample. And this is where the important stuff is. The couple of important files in folders. The first place that you get, the first thing that where you really want to look at is the Android manifest.xml. The Android X, uh, manifest.xml is think of it as a big bill of receipt, a big receipt, a big starting point. Android manifest.xml will show you like the starting class, the permission that the app needs to, um, yeah. look at that. So here are the default permission that this app needs access to. Internet, G4, Find location, course location, also known as GPS. Read contacts, send SMS messages, access Wi-Fi state, check if the boot of the device is completed. A list of all your uh, classes, all the classes and activities. And dependencies of the app. So the first thing that you want to look for, look at is the Android manifest, because the Android manifest becomes really important because you want to take a look at the default permissions. Of course, as you see here, the manifest file, the permissions, all these permissions here listed on virus total, mirrors exactly what's in the manifest file. So how virus total works for Android uh, APK file definitely looks at the permissions first. And some of these permissions look really, really sketchy. Like, the hell the uh, app need to read SMS, uh, send SMS messages, and read contact? Like, what? Okay. The second folder of interest to look at is something called the Smiley folder. What is Smiley? Well, think of Smiley as like the assembler code for Java. What is Smiley? Smiley, what is Smiley code Android? Here it is. Okay, think of it as, as like assembly code, but in Java.
I mean, it's not binary. You can't read binary. No, no, no. Smiley is basically an assembler, disassembler format um, used by Dalvik, which is Android format. So I'll just show you. Go to Smiley. And there's a whole bunch of little folders here. But if you dig deep, let's say com, CD Jazz, CD Go. Yeah, here we go. We got some Smiley files here. So I'm going to do more.smiley. Oh. And you can see human readable to a degree. Definitely smells like assembly. Now you can just do, just rip through these files to find any interesting URL. What the hell? You can just do a whole bunch like rip through these a bunch of right? to find any like interesting URLs and stuff. Okay. Hey Obliviner, how are ya? Oh, okay, so now, let's go into the thread of the other important file that you gotta look. Now, these are where you can find the smoking guns. Go to the RES folder. RES stands for resources. This is where hard-coded strings, pictures, icon, drawables, you name it, are located. I'm going to go to the CD res. But uh, I think there's strings where oh, CD values. Here we go. Look at that. More strings.xml. What the hell? Why is that? Uh, here we go. This is TikTok v3. Let's go to sample, our, the resources folder, drawable, that's where all your pictures and crap are. I'm going to highlight these all, and I'm just going to do a preview of everything. Oh, really? TikTok. What the hell is TikTok Pro? You seeing all this crap? Thanks, Bobby Table. How are ya? Hey, I don't know about you folks, but um, yeah, it seems like this piece of this Android app, yeah, this Android app uses a few um TikTok logos. That's not good. Is there such a thing? I don't have TikTok, and I'm not going to install that app, but is there a TikTok Pro app? Is there such a thing? I don't know. But all I know is that this app actually uses quite a few TikTok logos. And I don't think this app is TikTok. Yeah, this is malware. And in fact, I've never heard of TikTok Pro before. Like, I have never heard of TikTok Pro until, uh, until the... So... Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. One more thing. I want to do a search for, you know, here's, here's, here's where, like, Google is your friend. I want to do a search for this, uh, the SHA-1. Okay, that does, whoop, wait. Nope. All right, I want to take a look at the SHA-256, do a search of the SHA-256. Oh. Here we go. There you go.
Looks like we got TikTok malware, a fake version of TikTok here. Oh shit, we're over time. All right, we're over time. So what we've done, we've done uh, definitions, we've done a virus, we've done backdoor, we analyzed a uh, fake Android app. So now, for those who are part, like if you want, uh, I also have, this is the final lab of this course, Android malware analysis. There you go. This is open to the public. An Android malware, a real, okay. This one is, a, again, it's an Android malware analysis lab. This is a real piece of, uh, piece of Android malware we just did. So it's a difference, this, not, this is not TikTok. Uh, uh, this season's, uh, this fall's, uh, uh, X's lab is not TikTok. This is not TikTok. But it's something else. Something else. So, yeah. Have fun with this. We are not on the air next week because of, uh, for holidays. Want to wish everyone, uh, early happy Thanksgiving. Um, for, for folks who are traveling, safe travels. Please get some rest. We all need some rest next week. And I'll see you uh, in two weeks. And I'll see you all again in two weeks, folks. Please have, get some rest. Happy Thanksgiving, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bobby Table 24.